This is the first instructive word spoken by Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita. Shri Bhagavan Vacha Ashochan and Vashochastvam Pragyavadam Shabhashase Gatasuna Gatasumsha Nanushochanti Panditaha The first word that Krishna speaks, the first verse is 211. The first word that he speaks is Ashochan, not worth lamenting. Now, many of the Gita commentators who have studied the Bhagavad Gita throughout history, the Gita has, in Sanskrit, which is the language that is spoken, over a thousand commentaries by different people, a thousand existing commentaries. And there are several hundred English commentaries and, they, and many more also. So these commentators have often analyzed the Gita in terms of structure. So there's a significant symmetry in the structure. The last instructive word, so this is the first word that Krishna speaks. First words you can say. And then Krishna's last words. They will be in the, one of the most celebrated texts from the Gita, 1866. And that, Sarva that ends with Ma Shuchaha, do not lament. So essentially, the if you look at this text, what comes at the start and what comes at the end, that is a fair indicator of what is the core content. If a good speaker is or core content or central message, a good speaker, especially a speaker who speaks in an organized way, they will tell right at the beginning, this is the topic I'll discuss today. And at the end, they will say, this is what I discussed today. So if you look at the context of the Gita, the beginning and the end, from that, we understand that the core message is a message to free us from lamentation, from grief. So in that sense, this is meant to be a message of hope and positivity. That, that will give, it is, you could say something like uh, a grief counseling session. So from the broader context, is if you say, this is not worth lamenting, it can be, seem very strong, uh, but not worth lamenting is the first word that he speaks. And then what we can infer from this, and at the end he says, don't lament. Then what we can infer that what will be contained in the middle is how it's not worth lamenting. Hmm. So, for example, somebody has a sickness. Oh, this is so terrible. My hand is fractured and, you know, I'm a, I'm a ball player and without my hand, I can't function. My life is ruined. Say, no, 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 no. it's not worth lamenting. And that's what the doctor says. It's not getting worth, it's not worth getting worked up over. And then at the end, the doctor says, don't get worked up over. Then, in between, the doctor is likely to say that. Okay, now I'll tell you why it's not worth getting worked over. Maybe you can fix your hand. Maybe you can give a prosthetic hand. Whatever it is, it is going to address the issue. So that's what is the core message of the Gita. That can be inferred from its very first text, Ashocha, that no, it's not worth lamenting. So if we move forward, what is the thing? Ashocha. That shocha anva shocha stone. He says, although what is not worth lamenting, you are lamenting that. And so, here in one sense, uh, you know, instruction can be given by various ways. Sometimes, when we, there's instructing by contrasting. By contrasting means, suppose somebody speaks big, big words. 
I say we should never lose our temper. We should always stay calm. And then they get angry over a small thing. We're really, like, hey, you know, you're not really walking your talk. So Krishna is doing something similar. Hmm? So he's saying that you are speaking learned words. These learned words refers to Arjuna's arguments. Arjuna's arguments from the previous chapter, and to some extent, is it's still now all that he has spoken. They are not like we discussed. They are not foolish words. They are thoughtful words. They indicate that he is he's a reflective person. He is deeply contemplating his actions. But he's saying while your learned words are there, but in contrast, you consider verses. What's happening is uh, your emotions. You are exhibiting emotions that are uninformed, that are ignorant, that are. Childish, that are immature. So you are lamenting for something that's not worth lamenting. So the emotions are unworthy. It's sometimes a child has built a sand castle and that breaks, the child may start crying. Now, adult, no, that's not going to happen. There's no need to cry for that. So then, why is it not worth lamenting? He says there, there that those who are wise, he makes a very curious statement over here. The wise don't lament. And what do they not lament? They don't lament for the living or the dead. Those whose life air is in their body and those whose life air has left their body. The Gita is a philosophical poem and sometimes it uses very beautiful poetic alliterations. So living and dead it doesn't have any alliteration in English. But in Sanskrit, it's gatasun and agatasun. So there is a poetic element over there. He's saying that actually, the those who are wise, they see that there is no essential difference between the living state and the dead state, what we call as living and dead. He doesn't use actually the word living and dead specifically. He uses the more specific word that the life is present. He uses a concept of what, whatever brings life. The life or the source of life is present. Mm. The symptom of life is present or the symptom of life is absent. So the indicator of life, the symptom of life, mm, it's when it's present and when it's absent, the person, a wise person does not lament. So this is a very interesting thing. He's indicating that, that through this that the wise see that there is no essential difference between the between the stage when a person is alive and when a person is dead. Now that raises the question, how is that possible? There's a world of difference. A person who is alive is alive, a person who is dead is gone. So that he will address in the next two texts. But so Krishna is giving a parameter for wisdom. Like, like if you go back to the again the med medical metaphor. Say, suppose a patient is very worked up and suppose the patient is also a medical student. Patient also supposed to, patient has also spoken some, some medical jargon. But then the doctor may say, hey, you are speaking medical jargon, but you are getting worked up about something which a actual person who is a doctor, a person who is a medical expert will not get worked up. So on one side, it speaks medical jargon, jargon I am not using in a negative sense, basically it, it, jargon is used to indicate that a person has some medical knowledge, but then is disturbed by something that medicos won't get disturbed over. So that, that is the contrast that Arjun is being told by Krishna in this text. So it's not in one sense saying you are a fool. He's saying that uh, although you're speaking, the wise don't act like this. So that's mm -hmm. an intelligent way of calling somebody a fool. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't it? So you are such a fool. That's a very blunt way of, you know, you can criticize or as you say, call someone out. There's a blunt way. And there's a more refined way. So blunt way is, say you are such a fool. 
sometimes it also requires a certain level of refinement to understand this that i am also being my folly is being pointed out hmm? why is people don't act like this so that itself indicate that there is something lot more going on over here which is not known now how is it that there's no essential difference between the state of being alive and the state of being dead that's text 12 natve vaham cha tu nasam natvam neme janadhipah na chaiva na bhavishyamah sarve vayam atah param now krishna is in one sense heightening the mystery by telling something but not telling it fully so you're saying that this oh they will die he says that no they're not going to die so in one sense if we consider in the state of being alive and the state of being say dead we say that there are like a huge contrast between these two but while now krishna is talking about the present is where they are at there is the past and there is the future so he is highlighting that not only him he is talking about three basic protagonists over here he is talking about krishna arjuna and everyone else others hmm whoever are there is drawing them briefly so not all of these it's being said over here that they existed in the past they will be they are of course they are existing now and then they will exist in the future so in that sense what he is saying is that there is something which is this is just a rough indicator that there is a continuity of existence for everyone hmm? for each individual being there's a continuity of existence in the past they were there present they that means he's saying that death is not that big a thing you're getting worked up about that but in the past they were existing in the we all were existing in the present we are existing and even in the future we will continue to exist so this is now set going to set the stage for the answering the obvious question part the the body is going to die so we could say that the body didn't exist in the past and the body won't exist in the future so therefore through this the body didn't exist before a person was born this molecules were there they were different places and then when a person dies whatever way they are cremated or buried or whatever the body won't exist so in it raises the question what is it that our krishna is referring to when we say that we are all existing that he will mention in the next text so what really matters the kingdom doesn't that agree so the gita is going to raise the level of discussion so you can say kingdom present agreed but what really matters is that the soul's journey and then krishna will be talking later about how the soul's journey hmm, will be affected by arjuna's choices on the battlefield we can say the soul's journey then a, from that perspective what should arjuna arjun be doing that will be explained in the subsequent sections it's in interesting way krishna states this point that dehi no sminyatha dehi kaumaram yavanam jara tatha dehantara praptir dhiras tatra namuhiyati what is he saying over here that he is generally if we consider knowledge 
or we could say more growth of knowledge how does knowledge grow now it doesn't grow that i am at this level and i just take a high jump and i go to this level like i don't know and then suddenly i know so knowledge really it's like don't mm, uh, it's put it as a present knowledge and future knowledge it's not like knowledge doesn't generally grow by sudden leaps from where we are to some other place sometimes it can happen but most of the time knowledge grows in more that by building on what we know this is what i know and then this on that foundation this is what you can learn so the idea is that there is present knowledge and then there is our present knowledge or current knowledge and the new knowledge so the present knowledge that krishna is telling over here is that we see change of body and we understand that the no change of essential person of the core person we see that in our own observation and that he is talking in terms of three stages that if we consider a person's journey in this life when they are childhood youth and old age you see that there is a significant difference like sometimes if we meet somebody we come to know somebody in our youth or our later years of life and then they see a picture of ours from our school days maybe a school photograph they may struggle to find out who we are over there some similarities are there but there are some huge differences are there so over this time the body is changing and yet we say that hey you have become so tall now that means what is saying you when as soon as you use the word you i i am implying that there is something that is unchanging you the person is unchanging but become so tall that means there is something which is changing so the beyond beneath the change, changing is something which is unchanging so the the body the body is changing but the essential person krishna has not yet used the word atma or soul specifically but that's implied he says they he the embodied what is present in the body that is unchanging and this principle we understand within this life so within this life that there is a change of body but there is no change of the person we understand and krishna says this same will continue across lifetime also this life and then at the end of life krishna will talk about what will happen in a future life next life he, he will mention that more explicitly later but here is saying that there is no change of person so this part that tatha dehantara prapti that just as there is change of body in this life similarly there will be a change of body at the end of life so present knowledge of change of body in this life and the new knowledge that he is believing you can make a inference from this about that that is change of body at the end of this life there will be no essential change in the person the person remains the same so that's what krishna is stating in this verse the identity nature and destiny of the soul will be elaborated on but here krishna is giving us a reasonable inference as a starting point for the discussion so we discussed first point was 211 where the gita's purpose is to free from free us from lamentation that is discussed from the start and the end of the gita and then we also talk about the point by teaching by contrasting hey you are speaking like a medico but you are not acting like a medico you are lamenting for that which is not worth lamenting and then in 
2.12, Krishna is indirectly, in one sense, saying that, pointing to the eternality of all individuals over there. They're going to exist forever. And then what is going to exist? That he points to in the th 13th text when he says that a changing body in this life or next, this life or beyond, there is no difference. That there is something which is unchanging. The unchanging core, the unchanging soul is still there. And that is what we focus on. Thank you.